Say, preacher, why are you holding your phone? Because I'm debating reading some stuff. Why are you so worked up, preacher? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. What about this tweet that came out last week after the verdict? I would rather be guilty of trying to lift the load of my fellow brother than to attack and criticize them for their humanity. Molesting little girls is humanity. God's word creates and comforts and builds. Satan's words attack and accuse, malign and destroy. Don't let your words be a tool of Satan. Oh, he's waxing eloquent. It's a sad day when God's people are the ones who oppress. Instead of fighting like the enemy to oppress your fellow believer in the Lord, you should be like God and be merciful to help lift another's burden. Here's another one. Accusers love to make mountainous accusations and then claim victory over molehill results. These are independent Baptist preachers, retired pastors, men old enough to be my daddy. Here's another one. 95% of the convictions come from plea bargaining, which is often coerced. We don't convict the guilty enough, we coerce the innocent too much. This is after a guilty plea. Now he's the victim and we're all the bad guys. You can't make this stuff up. Here's another one from an evangelist. One of the saddest things that can happen to a society, a church, or a family is to produce a generation of people that do not know the meaning of loyalty. All of you know it all critics better watch out. Payday's coming. I replied to that tweet, copied and pasted it verbatim, only changed a couple of words. And here's what I said. One of the saddest things that can happen to a society, a church, or a family is to produce a generation of preachers that do not know the meaning of the word blameless. All you pedophiles better watch out. Payday's coming. When we uphold loyalty over morals, we got a problem. My loyalty is not to a man. My loyalty is not to a person. My loyalty is to the Word of God. I have no other loyalty. Not to a movement, not to a Bible college not to anything or anybody other than the Word of God. That's the only loyalty that I want to hear somebody preach about. If I ever get up in this pulpit and I start preaching loyalty to man over the Word of God, somebody need to usher me out of here and put me in a straitjacket because I've lost my ever-loving mind. Trigger warning. This podcast contains descriptions of various abusive situations. Listener discretion is advised. You are listening to the Preacher Boys Podcast, a podcast shedding light on decades of mental, physical, and sexual abuse within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The testimonies shared on this podcast are told from the personal experience and perspective of the survivors. Not all legal outcomes are known or final. Any suspect is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. To find more information about the Preacher Boys podcast and upcoming documentary, visit PreacherBoysDoc.com or connect on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at PreacherBoysDoc. Now, here is your host, Eric Skwarzynski. All right, Pastor Shiplett, thank you so much for joining me on the Preacher Boys podcast. Cast. Now, the very first question, because I've been curious for a while, who is Stacy Shiflett? Like when you describe yourself, <laughs> what's, what's kind of your background? Uh, who are you? <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm definitely multidimensional. Um, okay. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Baptist preacher. I'm a husband uh, of a precious wife. We just celebrated 25 years. Uh, I've got five children from 23 all the way down to eight. Four of my oldest kids are graduated from high school. And then I've got an eight-year-old. Uh, so I'm a dad. Uh, I, I love to sing, write, uh, write songs, play instruments. I'm a carpenter. I got into construction back in my teen years. And so I'm a, I'm a builder and a carpenter and love to build things and, and uh, put my tool pouch on and, and uh, get dirty. Um, I like to deer hunt. I like to ride dirt bikes. I like to read. Um, I just, you know, there's a lot of different sides to me, but, uh, I am a fifth generation, uh, Baptist preacher. It's just, uh, my heritage. Uh, my wife's a second generation. Uh, her dad was a pastor. And, uh, so our ministries, our life, church ministry, the Bible, reaching people. 
and um, trying to help people find God's will and live for God. That's, that's my passion. That's what I'm all about. So you're a fifth generation pastor. Wow. I, did, I, I, thought, I, I thought I was fourth generation. I knew I was fourth generation. Right. And then last year I discovered that it goes all the way back to the 1800s of, of my, my great, great, uh, I think great, great, great granddad. He was married wow. to a full blooded Cherokee, had a beard down to here. <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's crazy. And uh, the church that he used to preach at still, they're still having church in it in wow. Alabama. So yeah, that's my heritage, Eric. Wow. And was it Baptist all the way down the line? Was it five generations of Baptists? Perfect. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so tell me a little bit, just like growing up within IFB culture, growing up, I know we've talked previously and like you've, you know, it sounds like you've always kind of defined yourself as being a little bit outside of like the, the quote unquote movement, but can you talk to me a little bit about just growing up, you know, pastor's kid, like what your experience with kind of, you know, religion and faith was as a, as a young kid. Yeah. So my dad surrendered to preach when I was about four, that would have been in 76 and started pastoring small little churches down in South Georgia. And then he took a church in Valdosta. Um, my experiences in church has been like anybody's that's been in church. Uh, the highlights of my life, the greatest blessings of my life, some of the worst nightmares of my life. I've right. been, I've been hurt. Uh, anybody that's been in church for any length of time has been hurt because there's, you're, it, there's just people. Um, but uh, my dad got voted out of a church in the late seventies and uh, that put a bad taste in my mouth to start with as a little boy at just how church members that, that get fouled up and bitter can be how they can act. Um, and then, you know, I just grew up. Uh, my dad was a pastor and a missionary in the South Pacific. We were in the Samoan islands and then Hawaiian islands during the eighties. Right. And then, um, moved back to the States uh, in 89, I think it was. And my parents were in several churches, you know, a lot of people that's got a bad story that happened in one church. Mm-hmm. I had a lot of bad things happen in a lot of churches. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, so you but, diversified but, a little bit with your, well, uh, I mean, it's just, yeah. I, I've got such a, I've got such a, a, a multifaceted perspective of how things are because of that, you know, yeah. a lot of people, their, their whole, their whole perspective of church is the one church they were in something bad happened or the one bad pastor or the church split or ever how they right. were treated at this one church. Man, I've been in many churches all over the country, and so I've got a pretty diverse um, take on things, but some of the sweetest people I've ever met, some of the most godly people, sincere people I've ever met, uh, I met in church, and some of the most wicked, uh, demon-possessed uh, people I've ever met were, were Baptist church members, so I've seen it all, seen it all, right. I've heard it all, and uh, you know, I say this before, I've said it from the pulpit that nothing that I've dealt with and experienced in my ministry has soured me on the church. I still love the church. Uh, I love, I love what God does in my heart and in my life and my family. I, I'm where I'm at because of God working in, in, in my life through the preaching of the word of God. But yeah, along the way, there were a few bad apples. Right. And uh, along the way, there was some, there was some uh, gut wrenching moments and you have to just kind of put all that in perspective and, and just stay on track with God. But, uh, somebody asked me, said, how were you introduced to the, to the independent Baptist movement? I said, I think it was C-section. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, no, I, I've, I've said the same thing to some people and, you know, I've, because of the show, I think, you know, there's been some people who perceive uh, probably similar to how you feel. There's people that perceive like, oh, your motivation must be this for why you're doing it. Or you, you know, I'm assuming because you had A, B or C bad experiences is why you're doing it. And you know, someone, someone was like, Oh, you must've had a really you know, bad childhood. I was like, no, I had a really good childhood. And I said, like anybody, it's what you said. When you spend a certain amount of time in any situation, you know, especially when you're spending the first 20 years of your life within a context of, you know, a church, all of your absolute best memories are there and all of your absolute worst. And, you know, I always tell people, I'm like, all of my best, you know, I met my wife, you know, in an IP, like there's a lot of really positive things. Um, but there's also, you know, obviously some, some pretty bad things that can happen. And, you know, obviously, you know, some of those bad things are how we ended up finding each other. And, or I guess I would say I found you first, um, you know, and um, to be honest with you, and, you know, I I was shocked 
because at the point that you had released, you know, your video um, calling out how the situation with Giovanelli was handled, I was, and I think this kind of speaks to what my experience with the the pastors and the movement had been. I was shocked to see an IFB pastor say anything, you know, negative or critical about the IFB movement. Another, another pastor. Yeah. Another right. pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's because you don't, you don't, you don't run in the circles I run in. I, I've got 40 or 50 preacher friends that would have handled it. I'm not going to say they hand that would have handled it just like I did, but they would have, yeah. they would have uh, pushed back. I mean, it would have, but I mean, that's, that's the guys I run with. Okay. So when you, and, and another thing that I feel like needs to be clarified is this, I'm not saying you're doing it. It happens a lot. Is this broad brush painting of the IFB? Right. Um, for example, I I hate the label. I deal with this in my book, Wolves Among Lambs. I don't I don't like to be called IFB because I am independent of anybody. And so when you slap a label on me, I'm going to kick and scream because now you're associating me with other people that I may not approve of, agree with, right. or identify with at all. The IFB is is it's not. It's not a denomination. I don't know how many of your uh, friends and people know that. It's not an organized denomination. We are um, associated only by having a general um, s- same doctrine. That's the that, that's the bottom line. Is we would, we, I'd say most of us would agree on doctrine. Right. Um, then, then from there on all bets are off on what we would agree on, mm-hmm. whether it be uh, the, the way churches are operated, the role of the pastor um, and, 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 and just on and on and on. I mean, it's, it's so broad of a spectrum that I don't, I resist uh, being, being labeled IFB. I'm a Baptist in doctrine. I believe in the fundamentals of the faith, which I believe most Baptists would say they did. And, but we're unaffiliated which makes me independent with a small I. I'm not an IFB as in the movement. There's, there's no movement. There may have been back in the seventies with Jack Hiles, but there's really no movement to speak of because you've got, you've got sword guys, sword Lord guys. You've got Southwide fellowship guys. You've got guys that wouldn't go to either one. They're all called IFB, but they're not all in the same boat. So Mm -hmm. Uh, I, you, and that's another thing people try to shove me into a, a, a box and I won't fit because they have preconceived ideas of what they think I am and I'm not. Do, so I'm always, I'm, I'm always curious and, and genuinely curious because I, I, it's one of these things where I think two groups of people look at this situation and see two different things. And, you know, I, I was on the phone with a pastor about maybe a week ago now, and we were talking about that. He was saying, you know, I just don't, identify with the movement and, you know, and, and said kind of similar things. Like, I don't think there is a movement, you know, I think it's pretty diverse, but you know, when I look at it, I see, yes, there are definitely sects of the IFB, you know, you have your Hiles crowd, you've got your golden state crowd and yeah, you definitely have unaffiliated, you know, independent Baptist churches all, you know, that are independent, they're Baptist and their churches um, who wouldn't identify. And they just, you know, they start a church on the side of the road and they aren't part of the Southern Baptist convention. But, you know, I'm, I'm always interested. Like, do you feel like there's no, you know, cause the way I look at it is you have your unaffiliated independent guys, but there is definitely a, a certain way that these churches operate and function and like say an independent Baptist church may say they're not part of a movement, but they definitely will preach against, you know, affiliating with a Southern Baptist or a Reformed Baptist or something like that. Do you, do you feel like that there's that separation or that, that kind of distinction with the movement? Again, depends on which church you're in. Right. I mean, uh, the churches I came from were smaller churches, country churches down South. Right. Um, many of the pastors I had growing up never went to Bible college. Yeah. You know, some of them were bivocational. Um, they just, they, God called them to preach. And like you said, they started preaching and they weren't involved in politics. They didn't, they didn't come from a Bible college. They weren't influenced right. by a Bible college. They weren't, uh, they didn't have Bible college singing groups, tour groups come through. They was as independent as you could possibly get. Right. And for me to try to speak for the, for the independent Baptist churches, right. again, 
I'm contradicting what I said a while ago. They're all they're all different. Um, you say they talked about how they operate. Um, the independent Baptist, uh, as uh, for the most part, uh, believe in the fact that the pastor is the is the is the overseer of the church. Deacons are a, in a support role and should be spirit filled men and meet the biblical qualifications of a deacon. Many of the Southern Baptist churches would would be deacon run. You know, they would run the church in the fact that they would just tell the pastor you got to go and he would go. Um, uh, they basically was the leaders in the church and that's, that's upside down from what I understand about the scripture. So right. uh, the reason why Baptists have always practiced what you, what you refer to as ecclesiastical separation is just the Amos three, three can two walk together, except they'd be agreed. Uh, we would not normally go to a meeting, a camp meeting, a conference, a revival meeting of a church that, didn't line up with us doctrinally, whether it be a Calvinist church or a Calvinist Baptist uh, or a, a, a charismatic brand of Baptist or whatever. So, yeah, we that's pretty much a consistent thing is just pretty much staying in your lane and fellowshipping with people that have the same doctrine. But again, you know, of all the churches and preacher friends that I have, every one of our churches are completely different. Right. And we've got variations of philosophy and so forth. So, again, I just can't speak about everybody as a whole. That would be fair. Right. W- would you say that – so, I mean, obviously, I know you, you don't identify as the movement. Would you say, like – so I am hearing more and more about these, you know, the smaller churches. They're, you know, they're started by guys who didn't go to Bible college. They don't have those affiliations, which – I know you've called out the people who do look to those and make kind of create these affiliations within the movement. But do you feel like, the, so like a lot of people take issue with me saying, you know, the IFB or the independent Baptist movement, would you say that the majority of independent Baptists would be similar to where you're at as far as feeling like truly removed from a movement or a, an organization of any kind? Yeah. Most of the guys I run with would tell you I'm proud to be an independent Baptist, but they would also flinch at the label of the IFB right? because of what it's become, because of what it's become, what it's, what it's turned into, what it's been associated with. And, um, you know, these guys that I that preach for guys that I have in a preach for me, they're good guys. They're, they got character and integrity. You know, they may not have thousands of church members, but they're gold, their family solid. They're faithful. They're consistent. These guys haven't changed. They haven't, they haven't uh, drifted. They're, they're still on point from where they were 10, 15, 20 years ago, which is a good thing, especially when you're talking about biblical things. So they would, yeah, they would be like me. They would cringe if somebody says, oh, you're one of those IFB. We're like, man, don't do that to me. Because right. it has now become such a negative connotation um, that we just really would rather not be lumped in with everybody else. Sure. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about that uh, because I mean, obviously this is how I think most people who, you know, weren't near an immediate area became familiar with you was, you know, your video and and you just mentioned kind of what the IFB movement. So the actual, when we think of, you know, the, the people who would affiliate as, you know, Hey, we're part of this group of people. Um, You mentioned what it had become or the, or the scandals it was associated with. And it seemed like when, when the Giovanelli case came to, you know, light of how badly it was being handled, it, it seemed in your video, there was a, a sense of obviously like frustration with what was happening. But can you tell me like, what was the emotion you felt when you realized how it was being handled and kind of what was going through your mind when you decided to sit down and kind of make a public statement about the state of things? Well, I had talked to him on the phone, talking about Dr. Treber on the phone on that Wednesday um, after about five or six days of not being able to get anybody on the phone. They finally called me Hmm. and we had about a 30 minute conversation. And I just said, you know, this, this, what happened here happened. I said, I'm confident of it. I don't know that every detail of her story um, would pan out. I haven't had a chance to obviously vet everything she said, but, there's been enough that she told me that her story is credible. And I said, this has to be dealt with. I said, I will not be a part of a cover up. If I get a whiff that this is covered up, I'm going to go nuclear. Those are my words. I will go nuclear. At that point, right. I didn't really know what I was talking. I, I, I didn't have a plan. I just knew right. that I was, there was no way I was going to roll over 
and, and go along with the cover up. And that was on a Wednesday afternoon. And then on Wednesday night after the services, when he got up in the pulpit and made that statement, and I, my emotion was just shocked because he had assured me on the phone that he was, was going to deal with it. And, and um, I just, I was shocked. I was, then I was, then I was mad. And then it just, it just kind of turned into a resolve. Okay. This is, this is, so let's see how this is going. I'm going to, I'm going to have to deal with this because I was the only person that knew the truth. I was the only person that was here right. at ground zero and knew the facts. And I just knew that if I didn't speak up, nobody would ever know. So I didn't have much of a choice. And um, I just began to get word that they were going to accuse me of mishandling the situation, not giving Cameron a chance to defend himself. And he was innocent and, and she was lying on him. And I was like, I just looked at one of my sister Patrick and said, go get the camera. I fixed to make a video. I called uh, Sarah, made sure she was okay with it. I actually sent her the video after I made it, let her and her husband look at it. So are you okay with me putting this out? She was, she was weeping. She said, yeah, thank you. Um, I, you know, I run it by my deacons. I said, guys, I need to know you're behind me on this because I'm fixing up. I'm fixing to go big with this. I had an obligation to set the record straight, being the only person that knew what really happened. And um, up up until that point, I had never had a problem with Brother Treber. I'd been out there several times. I preached out there. Uh, I'd sang out there. My, my daughter was in college there. Um, for people, just don't throw this in, Eric, for people that accuse me and says, well, he just, he had it out, Pastor Schiffler had it out for that church, that ministry. I was personal friends with probably 12 or 15 Bible college presidents, and mm -hmm. I chose to send my kids to that school. Okay, so that's that's got to say something. That was the school that I felt like uh, I would be comfortable with them being at. Um, but then when this whole thing just, just went sideways, uh, of course, I pulled my daughter out, and um, mm. uh, it, just, it just went downhill from there. But uh, to, to answer your question, there was an overwhelming support for that video. I would honestly say 99.9% .9 of the feedback responses, emails, phone calls, letters, text messages that I got was thank you. It's about time somebody said something. And I mean, I was getting phone calls and text messages from nationally known pastors and preachers in America that I couldn't believe um said you did the right thing i support what you did so i don't think there's as many people out there um covering up as what some people think i think there's too many i think there's way too many or one's too many yeah right i don't think it's as many as people have allowed themselves to just say well everybody's covering up everybody's not and and people are tired of it and, and a lot of people are doing what they can within their own capacity to try to stop it. I just had the fluke opportunity to, to stand up and it just, it went viral. I mean, the video absolutely went viral and you know, I'm still getting letters from it two years later. Yeah. Do you, so, so you mentioned like obviously support, did you feel like, cause, cause from again, and this from the outside looking in. So like, so for me, I, I, I was so excited when I saw it and I retweeted it and shared it and was like, you know, finally someone, same thing. Finally, somebody's saying something. And in my mind, I was like, I don't know what I expected. I, I, I feel like I expected a, like the floodgates to kick open and for a bunch of people to publicly say what I think people had privately been kind of saying, but I felt like it was kind of silent publicly outside of that initial video which which yeah, was, was. Su which was really surprising to me uh, did that shock you did you think there would be other people that would publicly come out and yeah. say stuff i would or? yeah i did I, I was i was it was funny because even when a lot of the guys would call me or text me and say appreciate what you did it took courage i watched your video you weren't angry uh, i didn't feel like you were yeah. in the flesh i really felt like you were trying to follow the leadership of the lord on that uh, and though that encouraged me and, and I was surprised because I expected to just get creamed. I expected <laughs> right. to get absolutely buried, which yeah, I wait, wouldn't have cared. Yeah. I would not have cared. I, I don't care. I don't, I don't think about that kind of stuff, but I was shocked that, that there was so much support. Number two, I was surprised. I mean, people that privately supported me that never said anything on their social media or yeah. whatever. It was almost like they were secretly rooting for me, but they didn't want to be identified with me or draw fire. And that, that was a, a bit annoying, but again, it wasn't their battle. It wasn't in their yeah, church. Right. 
and they, they probably just didn't feel the need. I, I, some of my friends have said to me, said, I've had some of my preacher friends said, Brother Stacey, we didn't say anything because we knew you, you, you had it. If, if we felt like you needed us, we, w- we would have been there. But you were handling it. You were saying the right thing. We just stood mm-hmm. back and prayed for you. So I think a lot of them just kind of had that mindset. I don't know that sure. they were afraid or scared. They just didn't really feel like there was a proper place to insert themselves into that situation. Right. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. And, and again, like talking to people, cause I've, t- I've talked to many, you know, many people within the IFB since doing this. Um, and I, I'll say it again on the podcast. Like if anybody ever wants to hop on the phone, I'm more than willing to, to chat with them, but you know, I'm always interested hearing. And again, it's looking at the same situation and seeing like what people feel, you know, needs to be done. Um, and there's, you know, there's people who don't, who truly don't see any widespread issue with abuse or who really don't think that this is a, a big issue. Um, and, you know, I thought, I thought it was interesting. You shared a little bit in the video and I know you shared it in your book as well. You know, you've, this situation was not your first experience seeing, you know, abuse within the church and you shared a little bit of your personal story and background. Um, do you feel like that helped kind of push did, were you thinking about that at all when this case happened or was it well, something where, well, yeah, well, yeah. Because when I, when, um, when I, when, when I first found out it was a Friday, I think it was a Friday morning. It was a Friday morning. Uh, Sarah's granddad was on staff here. He's since retired. Okay. Uh, he'd been here 25 years. He was a great guy. I love him. I miss him. But Brother Hall was here, and he walked into my office and said, you know, I got something to tell you, and told me about what happened. Um, and immediately, I said, I, I need to talk to her. Let's get her on the phone. That was my, f- my first response was not to call Cameron and say, oh, heads up, there's a woman making accusations. Right. My yeah. first response was, I want to hear what she's got to say, and then I'll go from there. And literally within just a few hours, I had her on the phone and her husband on the phone, and I said, I want to hear um, what you're saying. I want to hear um, what, uh, what happened. And she says, well, I just, I don't think anybody's going to believe me. And I said, trust me, hmm. I'll believe you get, you tell me what happened and, and I'll, I'll believe you if you give me something to work with, obviously. Uh, and it's not because I have a gut that I trust my gut and not because of necessarily the leadership of the Holy spirit. But I had been in that very same boat yeah. before where I, I'd struggle with who do I tell? Nobody's going to believe this. It was so bizarre what happened to me. And for those of the people that, on your, that are listening that don't know, I was uh, assaulted in my sleep when I was 17 by a Bob Jones uh, University student that spent the night at our house. And uh, we confronted him and um, the, the sheriff locked him up. He pled guilty and didn't have to go to trial. He went to jail for two years and uh, was a registered sex offender still is. So that was when I was 17. Um, and then when I was a youth pastor, before I got married, I was on staff at a church, North Atlanta. And the pastor there was in his fifties. And uh, you know, he was just weird grooming me and making little statements here and there. And then one night in the hotel room, just point blank proposition me. Mm. And um, I just, it, it just shook me to my foundation. And I remember, for a month, I didn't tell anybody hmm. because I didn't think nobody's going to believe this. All he's got to say is I didn't do it. And it's my word against his. And he's been in the ministry 30 years. I'm a nobody. So when she says to me, um, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know you, uh, you don't, you don't know me. And I don't know if anybody's going to believe me. And I said, I'll, I want to hear what you got to say. Hmm. And so I could relate to that that lost helpless feeling when you've got a story to tell and you don't know who to tell it to. Right. Um, so yeah, that probably in some way helped me, but just between me and you, the way I made uh, my passion for justice. Um, if that, those things had not happened to me, I still probably would have listened to her and I still would have dealt with it. Cause that's just who I am. Right. Uh, but no doubt, I feel like God prepared me early on in life with some of the things that happened to me to help me be able to help others. Right. Yeah. I, I definitely get that sense that, you know, like when I think of like, you know, from, from the outside looking in, when I think of like, you know, Stacey Shiflett, I'm like, I think like fighter and, you know, and I think, 
I think when you get a sense, and obviously I know just from like our interactions and conversations, there's probably some things that we, you know, would disagree on and like anybody else, but I can tell that when you think that there's something that's being done that's wrong, like your reaction is not worried about, you know, what are people going to say? <laughs> it's, it's guns blazing. Um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah. So I was curious about that. I wanted to talk to you about, you know, obviously, you know, that situation, you know, that's where I came into it. I recognized you and, you know, saw what was happening there. Um, so I, I'm curious just on the practical side. So obviously this is, you know, a case very close to you and I'll, I'll probably insert some snippets from, you know, Know your video just for context for people, um, but you know I'm I, I'm curious when you when you look at your work moving forward because I know you've made an effort to you know make statements about abuse continually after this on a broader scale. Um, how has your I guess what's your practical goals as far as helping you know survivors of abuse? I know you you started a website for people who are victims of abuse. Um, you know, you were going to make that a large portion of a conference you're going to be holding. Um, so, so when you say, you know, I stand with victims, like, what does that mean for you? What's your practical kind of goals there? When I, when I, when I stood up uh, for Sarah and, and, and listened to her and, and sided with her uh, against who a guy who was my friend and, that just on paper, it was the craziest thing for somebody to do. I didn't, I didn't know Sarah, never met her. Um, she wasn't a member of my church. Um, many preachers would have just told her, I don't believe you. Sorry. Yeah. You go tell somebody else and their life would have been virtually unchanged. Right. But when I heard what she said and I began to ask a few questions around and corroborated a lot of key elements of her story at that point, it was no, it was not a decision or a choice for me. It was just doing the right thing. So when I say I stand with victims, um, what I mean is, first of all, I listen to them. Okay. I listen to them. Now I, I, you and I both know that there are people out there that make up stuff mm -hmm. and that muddies the water. And unfortunately, a lot of preachers use that small percentage of people as their reason for not listening to anybody. And that's a mm -hmm. cop out. Uh, I, I can tell if somebody's if somebody's shooting straight with me or not. And and Sarah was so so kind and so sincere. There was no there was no bitterness. There was no malice. There was not this 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 attitude of I hate this guy. I hate your church, and I'm going to bring you down. You know, and profanity and cussing that would have yeah. turned me off. But she was nothing like that. And as she began to talk, I just realized this girl's hurting, and and I listened to her. My heart broke for her. My deacons were in here the second conversation we had, and they were literally in tears. We were literally weeping as we listened to her story. And Eric, she didn't tell us everything. In fact, she didn't tell us hardly anything, but she told us just enough that we were just tore up at what had happened to her. So when I say I stand with victims, I listen to them. Uh, I cry with them. I sympathize with them. And then I try to walk them through whatever it is that they feel like they want. My, the question I probably asked Sarah 10 times is, what do you want? What do you need? I, I, it's not what I want. I already had a stack, a list of things I wanted uh, to happen when she told me that. But I was like, what do you need? What do you want? Do you just need closure? You want me to just pray with you? You want somebody to go with you to the police station? What do you want? To me, that is what victims i don't care if they've been victimized one time or if they've been dealing with it for 20 years that's the thing they need is for somebody to say what can i do to help you and let them tell you what they need and what they're looking for and then start trying to help them her her only demand was i just don't want cameron to be on staff full-time in the ministry where he can do this again and i said i'll do everything i can by the end of this week if i've got any say He'll be out of a job, I promise you. And uh, I was going out on a limb there, really. But I was, I was that determined to try and meet the one thing she was asking. Please get this guy out of the ministry. You know, so when I say I stand with victims, I listen to them. I try to help them. Um, I, I try to support them. Uh, I stand with them against the cover-ups of it, against the glossing it over, polishing it over. Preachers are the world's worst to get up in the pulpit 
and spraying Chanel number no. five on a dirty diaper. Okay, just it is what it is. If it happened, it happened. Just go ahead, deal with it, confront it, be honest with your church. You know, this is what happened. I hate it happened. Uh, we're gonna try to get to the bottom of it. Um, we 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 don't we don't condone this kind of behavior. We don't yeah. go along with this. It's amazing what you can say in 30 seconds. You got to get up there and go on and on for 45 minutes. 30 seconds. I made a statement to my church on that very first Sunday because she went public <clears> on Friday. Of course, it was on Facebook. So I mean, I was trying to. Yeah. I was just trying to. At that point, uh, I was playing catch up because I, I couldn't get in front of it. It was just happening. Yeah. It was unfolding. I got in the pulpit on Sunday morning. I said, "Church, that stuff's on Facebook." Um, I don't know what I was going on, but I'm looking into it. I'm dealing with it. And when I find out more, I'll come to you. In the meantime, let's just pray. And, and I'm very honest with my people. And it's funny because when you do that, it cuts out all the gossip. There's nothing to gossip about. Yeah. Everybody's like, okay, Pastor Schiff is aware of it. He's going to deal with it. He's not going to cover it up. As soon as something breaks, he'll tell us. And they walk out the door talking about something else. It's the, it's the guys that try to cover it up. It backfires on them every single time because people smell them cover up a mile off yeah. and most people bristle at the, the, at the injustice of that. Mm. And uh, so, you know, somebody said to me, said, well, my biggest concern is that our church doesn't get sued. I said, well, maybe you ought to side with the victim every now and then, if you're worried about getting sued, yeah. you know, it's like they don't think about it. Let's just cover it up, make them go away. I like it didn't happen. And that's not standing with the victim. Right. I'm, I'm curious about that. Like, what do you think about, because obviously a lot of churches are getting involved in, you know, there's been a lot involved in cover-ups, you know, I mean, obviously you've referred to your own experiences with, you know, seeing ministries try to sweep under the rug, cover up, you know, um, like, do you think that churches should bear some responsibility for when abuse takes place in their ministry? So like, you know, I mean, we're seeing that happen. I mean, there's, there's churches in, you know, Wildemar right now with, you know, multiple cover-ups. And I know you probably don't want to speak to specific, you know, church examples, but you know, you're seeing organizations like this where they're getting hit with lawsuits for negligence or for allowing things like this to go on. Do you think that's something that should be happening? Do you think that that's like, again, do you I'm think go, that's I'm important? Go what I said a while ago, if I was a pastor at a church, which I was, I was a pastor at a church where the guy before me did something wrong. Right. I said to the victim, what do you want me to do? What hmm. do you need? And I did everything I could to try and, and, and meet that need. I think a lot of pastors and churches are getting sued because they're not willing to make any concessions at all, do anything at all to recognize the pain, the sufferings, the hurt of these victims. Um, again, they're, they're more concerned about how's this going to affect my church? Uh, how many people am I going to lose? Am I going to mm -hmm. be in the media? Um, am I going to get sued? If they would just do the right thing and not worry about any of that, my, my, my word to them would be just do the right thing. And don't worry about the rest of that and you'll be fine. It's the circling your wagon and kicking into uh, to, to self-protection mode that many times compounds the problem. I was a victim of circumstances. Jack Treber was a victim of circumstances. He had nothing to do with what Cameron did here 11, 12 years ago. Right. All he would have to said was, listen, <laughs> You know, I don't. I wasn't there. I don't know what happened. If this happened, this is terrible. I, I can't go along with it. We're going to look into it, try to find out what's going on. We're going to talk to the victim and get some more uh, information. And and if with this happened, we're going to stand with her. I mean, again, a thirty-second conversation. It's not complicated. But they don't do that. They start covering for each other. They start building these walls. They start pushing the victims away, making right. them feel like they don't have a right to say anything. And um, I'm not saying that the victims many times are, are justified in all of their demands. But I, it's been my experience. If you'll just meet them halfway, they're just so grateful that somebody recognizes and acknowledges what's happened to them. And, and that's just not happening. And I hate it. Hmm. You know, it never crossed my mind that we were going to get sued. That right. was the furthest thing from my mind was, Oh, what happens? What am I going to do if we get sued? Well, if we get sued, we get sued. But if I get sued, I'm going to get sued having done everything I possibly could to make sure this person's okay. Yeah, it, it's an interesting, that's one of the most interesting comments I always get is, you know, like, well, don't, we don't want to keep talking about abuse because it's hurting the cause of Christ. Or if, you know, if we talk about this or show it, I'm like, isn't the abuse <laughs> hurting the cause of Christ? Like, isn't yes. the, isn't the cover up of that, 
look a lot worse than, you know, if it comes out like we're seeing, you know, you, you see that happen with First Baptist of Hammond. You see that happen with, you know, all of these ministries with, you know, legacies of abuse. And it's just been cover up after cover up because there's these political, you know, for whatever reason, they, they bond together more than they do with their own people. I'm going to make a bold statement here. I'm going to say the cover up's more damaging to the church than the actual crime. Hmm. Yeah. People as a whole, understand the depravity of man okay this 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 pastor is a con artist he's a charlatan he's a womanizer okay it's it, we live in the real world that that's going to happen every now and then what they can't stomach is everybody circling the wagons and act like it's not that big of a deal that mm -hmm. is what's hurting the cause of christ right i okay let, let, i want to prove that to you because what cameron did here he did it it was in the news it was in the newspapers it was on tv it happened. I have yet to get one negative response from our community or from the media hmm. or have one family leave our church over what Cameron did yeah. because of how I handled it, how I responded to it. It coalesced and brought people together. Hmm. Our people in this church, and he was their pastor 11 years, man. Hmm. I'd only been here at the time three or four. For me to have to get up in the pulpit and say, the former pastor that many of you got saved under, that baptized you, married your kids, buried your grandma, you know, this guy did this. That wasn't easy for me. Right. I mean, you're talking about making your stomach knot up is knowing you got to set up and face a church of people and saying, this is what happened. But it's what happened. It wasn't my fault that it happened. I had nothing to do with it. I wasn't here. Yeah. But it was my responsibility to make sure that the right things were said and done. And I did that, and our people stood behind me. In fact, the day that I stood up and said, this will not be covered up, there were people standing up and clapping in my church. Hmm. It was unbelievable. And I created, because of my fairness, I created an environment where Sarah and TJ could actually come back and be in our services, and our hmm. people loved on them and hugged their neck. And they, you know, they, they're not members here. They, they live a pretty good ways away. But. They've yeah. been multiple times, and every time they came in, people loved them and hugged their neck. And I'm thinking, this is how it's supposed to be. This is how it's supposed to be, where the person that got hurt here can come back here and find healing. Yeah. And I just don't know why it's so complicated. I don't, I don't get it. Right. Well, I think you, you erased, in, in many ways, you, know, you erased the cover-up side. <laughs> you, you took out the organizational you know, responsibility. Cause, cause at the point you would have done nothing, there would have been a shared responsibility for anything that would happen moving forward, you know? And, that, and that's where, that's where I just don't understand, you know, you're, I don't understand how guys think they're protecting their name by, by hiding this stuff, you know, cause I, well, the story in their, in their defense, in many cases, that's how they were trained. Hmm. Okay. This goes back to wherever they went to Bible college right. and the philosophy that was pumped into them for four years in Bible college. From, from then, guys who were in trouble for the same stuff, right? Exactly. And so when, when, you're, when you're involved in cover-ups and you're covering scandals and you've got preacher boys sitting in front of you, they're going to follow your example, whether it's through the teaching or just through observation of your example. And yeah. so that, that, created, that created just um, a widespread philosophy that was flawed for the cause of christ you know we're a soul winning church the devil's fighting our church because we're trying to win soul <laughs> no the devil's fighting your church because your former pastor or your youth pastor can't keep his hands to himself okay just say quit hiding behind your bus ministries quit hiding behind your track racks and call it what it is yeah. and just man up and own it and that's the thing that bothers me that they're just like and then they look at you like you're crazy because you're going but this isn't right no, i can't believe you're siding with these people that are trying to destroy our church these people are not trying to destroy our church. The guy that was messing with the kids in the back room was trying to destroy the church. Right. You yeah. know, and it's so cockeyed how they look at it. I don't see how anybody that's been in the ministry for longer than six months can still think that way. It blows my mind. Mm -hmm. But again, that's how they were taught. And uh, so I wasn't taught that way. <laughs> right. I was yeah. just taught to be honest and be real and be genuine, be transparent, have accountability and have a heart for people. And not be right. so self-centered and cultish and be a dictator and tell everybody in your church what to think and what to say and not to say. Just do the right thing. Your people will follow you. Hmm. Yeah, I, 
I, I usually ask the question on the show, you know, and, and, but I think we've kind of hit it as, you know, whether or not we think abuse is a systemic problem in the IFB. And I, I you know, I think you kind of answered that earlier when you said, you know, I wouldn't associate with the movement. There is definitely, you know, I think we agree there is an, for you to be an anomaly, there has to be something that is normal. That's, you know, not great. So there, there is definitely people who would align with the movement, but I want to kind of just go a little bit deeper because you are a pastor and, you know, you talked a little bit about like the ecclesiastical separation, the way the church is structured. And, you know, I look at, you gave the example of you and, you know, Jack Treber, like there's two people got the same information, same time frame, two different responses. And I, I have to ask, cause like when I look at the IFB, one of the things that concerns me, especially now dealing with a lot of survivors is there's not a lot of accountability in a lot of these churches. And you had mentioned earlier about, you know, there being one person, you know, one pastor leading the church versus an elder led church and things sure. like that. And, you know, theologically, like my understanding is like a plurality of the, like leadership and elders is a good thing. But I, I'm just curious, like within the IFB, a lot of the churches are structured. It's the one man in the pulpit, the man of God, and then he kind of makes the decision, steers the ship in a lot of ways. Um, do you think that that plays, do you think the structure of the church lends itself to abuse being able to be covered up a lot easier? Because there's not that, like for most pastors, there's not another pastor who can come in and say, hey, have you thought about this? Or why are you doing that? Or, or yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. And I, I, I've, I've heard and read of people that felt like because of the way the church government is set up, that it opens the door for corruption, for abuse of power. And it does, no question about it. But I want to say this. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul said in verse 19 and 20, and you never hear these two verses preached or quoted together, against an elder, that would be a pastor or someone in a leadership position, against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses, period. Next verse, them that sin, rebuke before all that others may fear. You never hear that second verse. Join them with that. And that's the context. Yeah. What, what it is, is that is, a, that is a protection against false accusations, which happen. Unfortunately, they happen against God's men. Right. Not necessarily about sexual abuse. It can be about a variety of things. He said this to me or whatever. And so there is a, the benefit of the doubt goes to the pastor. But if there are two or three witnesses that vouch that are willing to come forward and say, and that many times is the glitch in this whole thing. You can't many times find two or three people hmm. that are willing to stand up and say, listen, preacher, you're wrong. This needs to be dealt with. And, and then take it to the next level. There are biblical provisions for that when it happens. Unfortunately, many people that have been done wrong, respond wrong. And two wrongs don't make a right, okay? If I'm a pastor and I, and I hurt you in some way or I say something to you and I do something wrong to you, and in your response, you just go and start trying to destroy the church and pull people out and you never deal with it biblically, you're not helping the situation. That doesn't make what I did any less wrong. But that's many times what church members do is they don't respond biblically to a situation that desperately calls for people to be spirit filled, spirit led and go by God's formula for dealing with the problem. And so then it just kind of spirals. And here's what happens. And I've seen it happen so many times. A pastor may be wrong. Three or four people get wadded up about it and then they respond wrong and start acting horrible. Well, what they just did was in the eyes of the rest of the church, they kind of label themselves by their behavior as a wolf or as someone that's trying to destroy the church or destroy the preacher, if they'd have been spirit filled and handled it biblically, they probably could have fixed it, but it compounds many times. Now going back to this whole government thing of how the church is set up, the Bible is very clear. The pastor is the overseer. The Holy ghost made him the overseer acts 20 says, but the qualifications of the pastor is that he be spiritual and biblical and blameless. And he gives this long list of qualifications. Well, if you've got a guy in the pulpit that doesn't meet the biblical qualifications of the pastor, don't be surprised if he does something stupid. Don't be surprised if he doesn't lead the church astray. He should have been there to start with. So, you know, the checks and balances are in place in Scripture. The pastor is supposed to be 
the example. He's supposed to love the flock. He's supposed to to be a man of character and integrity and transparency and not given the filthy lucre and blah, blah, blah. Well, if you got a pastor that's been a pastor for 30, 40 years and he's waved about a half a dozen of those and you got a church full of people that are okay with it, all bets are off of how far he's going to go with it. And so the problem is not the Bible and the problem is not the government set up that God gave the church. The problem is either the pastor or the church members or both are not spiritual and doing things biblical. And that's mm-hmm. a recipe for disaster. Right. I, I just have a, and, and this is more, I guess, a theological question. And it's one that I've, I've kind of thought about, you know, doing this and, and just looking at situations is like, so you look at, you know, don't accuse an elder or a, a pastor without, you know, two or three witnesses. Um, so how does that play out practically when you have a situation where someone is, you know, raped and no one's around, or if someone is molested or how should someone biblically approach a situation like that if there is no, no witness there? That's a great question. And that was the same quandary I found myself in when I, when, when that situation, that motel room came about, what do I do? There's no, there's nobody saw her hurt. I couldn't even believe it happened. I I, I knew nobody was going to believe it happened. I couldn't believe it. I was in a state of shock here, but here's what happens. And I'm not trying to be spooky spiritual here, but I'm just going to shoot straight with you. Okay. Because God's the, the word of God is right, and God is God is God, and the Holy Spirit can do the job of the Holy Spirit. When I when I prayed about it, and I felt peace and liberty from God to move forward with confronting it, God parted the Red Sea, and the table of men that I sat at, the deacons, the trustees, I had my dad there, my pastor from my former church there. Another third party that was there, another preacher there was just kind of moderating this thing. I went to that meeting thinking this guy's going to say I'm a liar and I'm, and my ministry is going to be done before he even gets started. Mm-hmm. You know yeah. what? The guy admitted it in a room full of people and, and they asked him to resign. And God, God helped intervene on my behalf because my heart and my motives were right. And because I was a victim, God worked out those details. And so many times, and I deal with this in the book, when I talk, I tell victims, I said, you, you've got to say something. Yeah. You've got to talk to enough people till you find somebody that will listen to you and believe you and help you move forward with trying to get it resolved. But many people don't speak up because they're afraid nobody's going to believe them hmm. because of that verse. Right. There's yeah. not two or three witnesses. And that's why sexual predators and pedophiles they use that to their advantage. It's right. the perfect crime, Eric, because there's nobody that can that can vouch for what happened. And then the guilt and, and the shame of being a victim just compounds the, the pressure for a person to not say anything. It's the perfect crime and cover up scenario, hmm. uh, which is one reason why I guess I'm so passionate about it, because it's just so wrong on so many levels. But if a person's been abused by a pastor or a youth pastor, they, I tell young people, you need to go to your parents. Parents, you need to go to the pastor. If it's an adult, you need to go to your husband, your wife, get somebody, go with you, go to the deacons. You got to do it biblically. Because even the Bible says you go to that person, and if they don't hear you, then you get a couple other people and you go, and then if they don't hear you, then you bring them before the church. That's the biblical formula, and it works if it's done right. And and just to clarify too, just for people listening, like with especially if it's a case of you know a criminal act or something with a, especially involving a minor your first call would be to like law enforcement, correct? Like Absolutely. you deal, you deal with it internally. I just want to make sure, cause I, I've heard you mention that before. I just want to make sure people don't misunderstand if it's a case of rape or molestation, like don't wait, go to the I'll police first. And, I right. go a step further. I say, even if you suspect, you don't even know if it was criminal. Yeah. Say it's a 18 year old boy and a 16 year old girl yeah. or a, you don't even know if there's a crime. Here's what I tell people. Go to your police department, your sheriff's okay. department, talk to somebody, tell them what happened and say, do I need to report a crime? Was there a crime? I said, even if you don't know if it was a crime, you need to treat it like one because there may be a, there may have been a line that was crossed legally that you don't even know about. Go ahead and do that. And yes, I, I, I always, always encourage people to go to the law. A church is not a substitute for the legal system that God has in place. Right. What do you see as, I talked to you about practical steps for supporting survivors, but like, what do you see as the solution 
for this issue? I mean, obviously sinners are sinners. People are people, you know, if you get a hundred people in a room, you know, two or three are going to be bad. You know, it's just gonna, there's always going to be something. So you can't yeah. completely stop it. But I'm curious, like, what would you like to see maybe churches do pastors do um, church members do like, what steps would you like to see happen that would make this less possible, you know, um, yeah. and well, maybe what steps you've taken. You know? We definitely have to change the status quo. We have to, we have to tilt the table. And that happens by calling it out when it happens. Um, it don't matter if it's a big name preacher or the big church and Bible college. If it happens, you call it out. You call them on it. You don't say, ah, oh, man, I don't know. If, if it's happening, it's happening. And, and, and the, it starts at the top. The pastor's philosophy and his integrity and his, his appreciation and love for in, uh, transparency and accountability will then filter down through the church. If you've got a pastor that has no accountability measures, whether it be about the finances or whether it be about anything, yeah. you've got a problem. Okay, it, that, that is a problem waiting to happen. So there has to be a self-policing, number one, where a pastor sets up protocols and procedures, you know, whether it be offices with glass doors, cameras everywhere. Um, for example, when it comes to our finances, I told people, I said, for me to steal the money from our church, I'd have to hit the usher in the head, take it out of the plate because I don't have, a, I don't yeah. have the combination to the safe. I don't write checks. I don't have access to the online banking. I don't even have a key to the office where they count the money. I don't touch it. I set those up. Those weren't in place when I got here. I set those up. I created boundaries and, 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 and protocols and policies to protect me and to ensure that our people have faith in the system. So if you've got a pastor that's crooked, he's going to figure out some way to circumvent it. But the way the solution to changing this cover up mentality is the people in the church bless their heart. And I say that with the, with the nicest, kindest South Georgia pat them on the head, bless their heart. I can't believe the people that sit in churches and don't say anything. Mm. Obviously if a pastor's not saying anything, that's a problem. But when you've got a church full of people and daddies and husbands and mamas that don't say anything, that's a big problem. They're enabling that pastor to keep covering it up. If, if, if I was to stand up in this pulpit on Sunday morning and do something that even look like a cover up, my church would stand up and say, I don't think so, doc. No, they would shut me down. I've trained them to do that. But if you've trained your people and you've suppressed them and you've put muzzles on them and anytime they ever came to you, you shot them down or you shot at them from the pulpit and made it, made it an example out of them, made it so uncomfortable that they had to leave. And then you ostracize them and you tell your people, don't talk to them. They left our church and, and they're, they're blacklisted. That creates a cult mentality where nobody wants to speak right. up. Yeah. Well, a person that would sit in a church like that, they're a victim waiting to happen. Mm. I'm sorry. Yeah. They need to get their family out of there and get their church, their family in a healthy environment where the pastor understands his biblical role and his biblical limitations as a pastor. That's he's awesome. not the, he's not the Pope. He's not the cult leader. He's the shepherd. And as long as I'm operating within the parameters of that scripture, I've got a biblical right to do what I do. But the minute I sidestep that Bible, I'm on my own and I am open to whatever tax happens. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a, I mean, that's a really good answer. And I think that's a really good place to stop for now. I, I feel like we could probably talk for two or three more hours about this subject, but um, I, I really appreciate you taking time to, to do this and to, to sit down and discuss this with me. And just before we go, um, I know there's people who maybe this is their first time hearing from you and, you know, maybe this is their first time knowing about the work you've been doing in this area. So what's maybe the best one or two places for people to, to follow you or to check out your resources or materials on this, on this subject? Oh, that's good. Cause I've got uh, Twitter. I've got Facebook. Uh, our church has a YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel, uh, but our church website, cbcdun.org would, uh, has got my cell phone number. I, I'm, I'm available. I mean, I've had hundreds and hundreds of victims call and email me and my wife, and we're still counseling people that have read our book. God's used it to help so many people. And so we're available. If I can do something to help, I've had pastors call. So I've got this call on my church, walk me through how to fix this. Uh, we're available. I don't have all the answers. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you, I don't know the answer, but 
I believe that together we can turn the tide, we can restore our credibility. And um, I would just really encourage your listeners, if you've got folks that are not in church, that are out of church, maybe they got hurt, you know, they got mistreated, they got abused. I would really encourage them to not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but try to find a good church where there's a godly pastor, pastor's wife that are trying to do it God's way and get back into the work of God and in ministry and, and don't, don't just become a casualty. That's the part that kills me. Those people just get washed overboard in a storm and it, it hurts. Uh, and, and the devil's, you know, he would love to see people just get out and discouraged and get bitter and have a bad taste in their mouth. Yeah. And I would encourage them, find a good church and a church family and people that will love them and, and be good influences and stay in the word, stay in the, uh, on their knees. And if I can do anything for anybody, uh, I'm available. You can reach out to me again. My name, Stacy Shiflett, is pretty much how you find me on Twitter or Facebook or whatever. And so, yeah, Eric, and I appreciate the, uh, the interview. I appreciate the questions, and I hope it was helpful to some people. Uh, don't judge all of us by the few knuckleheads you've run into. We're not all the same. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, awesome. Well, yeah, again, I appreciate it. And definitely, you know, I'll put all the links in the show notes so people can find your information and um, definitely recommend to people to check out, you know, some of your content, go to uh, pick up a copy of Wolves Among Lambs. Uh, and that way you can uh, get a good perspective and hear some more of your story. So thank you again so much for coming on. And uh, we may have to do this again sometime and uh, get, get, in up, get a little bit deeper. I'm game so. if you are. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes and don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.